also, um, again, that, that's for nurseries for both uh, 5.30 and 7 p.m. services. And we're gonna do the candlelight service uh, in this space. So uh, while it, it's not what we're used to, uh, what, what else is new this year, right? <coughs> um, wanted to uh, thank you for uh, all your support this year, uh, coming in as uh, your new pastor. It has been very different. I still have not uh, worshiped uh, in um, the sanctuary uh, with uh, all the faces in the pews. Uh, it has, I still haven't seen the, all the children uh, running in the hallways with, through with Sunday school, although uh, we hope to be working on that soon. Uh, pray for all those who are still struggling from uh, COVID-19. Uh, how are we doing on time, Johnny? Got about four more minutes. All right. Well, I see. I, th I thought I was going to be far more long-winded than I was. How about that? Uh, well, I also, uh, did want to uh, say uh, thank you to uh, the Carnegie family uh, who provided the uh, wreath on the uh, sanctuary's uh, exterior facade. Uh, they give that uh, in memory of Caleb Granger, uh, Saluda Dunbar Carnegie Senior, C. Granger, and uh, Roberta Edens Carnegie Jr. Uh, as, and we uh, also have the uh, DeKalb uh, Street uh, facade on the Westminster Hall given uh, by the Nettles family uh, in loving memory of Mr. and Mrs. W.D. Nettles, Nettles and Beth Nettles. Um, we also have our candelabras given uh, in memory of Mary Martin. And uh, a couple other things, don't forget uh, our offering plates uh, are in the rear as you uh, exit uh, after worship. Um, please uh, don't forget your tithes and offerings. Please pray for uh, first quarter programs and ministries um, for 2021. We are working diligently to um, reimagine what um, programs and ministry and um, mission will be for first quarter. Uh, play, pray for our staff and uh, all the committees of session as they go forward of uh, trying to get ready for another unusual uh, beginning of a year. Uh, while uh, 2020 has been uh, almost in the books, we still have 2021 to uh, consider uh, COVID-19 and um, we still aren't sure what's gonna happen. So uh, while we always live in uh, unusual and uncertain times, um, we are, however, guaranteed God's uh, presence in all of this. So let us look for uh, God in the midst of it. Now let us take the next few moments. Uh, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning. And um, we will look forward to um, Ms. Brooks' beginning.
Good morning. And welcome to Bethesda Presbyterian Church. We are glad that you are here. We are glad that we could uh, come in this way uh, to you viewing at home. Uh, we want to uh, welcome you this uh, final uh, and fourth um, Sunday of Advent. Uh, Merry Christmas. Hope uh, God has been good to you. Uh, may God bless you in all that you do. Uh, we wanted to... Um, encourage you to uh, prepare your hearts and minds for worship as we uh, were serenaded by Ms. Brooks uh, on the harp. What an awesome instrument that was. Thank you so much. Uh, we'd like to now invite the Guy family uh, to come up and light uh, this morning's uh, Advent wreath. The fourth candle of Advent is the candle of peace. It is sometimes called the Bethlehem candle to remind us of the place in which preparations were made to receive and cradle Christ's child. Peace is a gift that we must be prepared for. God gives us the gift of peace when we turn to him in faith. And you child will be called the prophet of the most high, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The prophet Isaiah calls Christ the Prince of Peace. Through John the Baptist and all the other prophets, God asks us to prepare our hearts so that he may come in. Our hope is in God and in his Son, Jesus Christ. Our peace is found in him. We light these candles today to remind us that he brings peace to all who trust in him. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the peace you give us through Jesus. Help us prepare our hearts to receive him. Bless our worship. Guide us in all the way, in all that we say and do. We ask in the name of the one born in Bethlehem, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. Restore us again, O God of our salvation. Our indignation towards us. Revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord. Grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good. Let's worship the Lord this day. Let's stand for him, 161.
seated. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us confess our sin uh, together as a family in Christ. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, you sent your Son to earth to redeem our sinful souls. Have mercy upon us as we confess our sin. You call us to work for peace in the world and with each other. Instead, we create division with those whom we love. Your Son calls us to go forth and proclaim the good news to all nations. And we remain silent with those who need to hear of your love. Forgive us in our indifference to your calls of peace. Help us to embrace the Prince of Peace and convict our hearts that we may serve you with joy and peace. Let's have a moment for personal confession. Amen. Jesus Christ is our peace who reconciles us both to God in one body through the cross. In the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, we are forgiven. Let us stand. we are still standing, let us affirm our faith in uh, the Apostles' Creed. Sisters and brothers in the family of God, what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.
This is the moment uh, in non-COVID uh, life that we would pass the plate, uh, place our offerings, our tithes. Um, also, we would talk about and remind ourselves how we are to give back ourselves, uh, give back to those around us, all of God's people. We are to be a gift to them, those whom God places in our path. Let us um, meditate uh, each day on how we might be uh, a greater gift, a greater resource uh, to those um, whom God has placed in our lives. Uh, now we get the extraordinary opportunity to hear once again Miss Brooks and her gifts. Thank you.
This morning's Old Testament lesson comes from Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Hear the name of the Lord. A shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of God. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with a rod of his mouth, and with breath with his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat the straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hands on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Amen. 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 God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> A gracious God, we come before your eyes this morning, this fourth Sunday of Advent, this Christmas season. Lord, we ask that you would bless us. Pour your Holy Spirit out upon us and open the eyes of our hearts that we may see you anew. Lord, let our hearts swell with your love and may we treat others with graciousness and truth, trusting that you'll be in and amongst all of our relationships, all our actions. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling this day. We pray for the sick, the homeless, the hungry, those who have lost their hope. Lord, we ask that you, we would be your hands and feet in this world, that you may use us in a new way. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for its leaders and the leaders of the world. We pray that your will be done through this all. Lord, while we might not understand your plan, help us to pray for your plan to unfold, that we might be willing participants for your plan, your path for our lives. Help us to be the people that you've called us to be. May we reflect your love your grace, your unconditional favor for us, that we might reflect that to all. Help us to be more like you and less like ourselves. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling from COVID around the world. Lord, we would pray that this would cease and this plague would be over. Lord, help us use this wilderness time in, in prayer with you that we might reconnect with you in a new way. 
Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for the gift of life, the gift of love. Mostly we thank you for the greatest gift of all, and that's Jesus Christ, whom we celebrate came into this world in a manger. And we know because of our sin, your son had to die on that cross to do the thing that we could not do for ourselves, to redeem us before your eyes. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that redeems each and every one of us. May we choose your will, your path for our lives every day. Lord, we pray for those here at Bethesda who are struggling. We pray for Betty Sue Weber, Susan Marshall, Jim and Gail Sinclair, Betty Coombs, Lynn Bradley, Cornelia Biddle, Mary Tatum, Cindy Derringer, Harvey Shaw, Mel, Mel Pearson, Dan Outlaw, Faith Outlaw, Judy and Scotty Martin, and all the extended friends and family of this church. Now let us, Bethesda Presbyterian Church, join our voices together in one voice and pray the prayer Jesus taught the disciples to pray. Praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. This morning's New Testament comes from Romans, Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 13. Hear the words of Paul. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instructions, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with each other in accordance with Jesus Christ, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another. Therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God, for I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God, in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you this mo moment. We would ask that you would help us to hear your words of love and truth for our lives. Lord, pour your spirit into this place and sing to our souls that we might respond in kind. Lord, bless the words from my mouth and the meditation I offer here this morning. May they be a blessing to you and glorify you, O oh God. 
and may we hear you in the midst of it. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning is uh, the, the um, fourth Sunday in Advent. We, we celebrate the peace that brought uh, to all humanity through the Christ child, God's most awesome gift to all people throughout time and space. The Guy family relit the can candles of hope, love, joy, and peace. Now, we wait for the coming, uh, celebrate the coming of our Lord uh, on Christmas Eve. We invite you to, to be part of that if, if you uh, so desire and can. Luke chapter 2 verse 10 um, proclaims glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace among those whom he favors. The angel declares uh, God's peace upon God's people. Peace is a rare commodity these days. In Romans, Paul writes, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Here he directly is saying the Mosaic scripture is worthy of our time, and our attention. We worship not only the Lord of the New Testament, but the Lord of the Old Testament, for God is one and the same. Paul, let's not forget, Paul was a scholar, a Jewish scholar, who along with the Apostle Barnabas sat at the feet of Gamaliel. One of the greatest rabbinic scholars of his time. And not unlike Jesus, who knew the Torah, Paul also knows the Torah and understands the value of knowing God from the scriptures as well as what's happening in the present day. Paul goes on to quote the prophet Isaiah as part of the homage paid to the scripture of former days. Paul offers up, may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another and then in accordance with Jesus Christ so that together um, we may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then get, Paul goes on to say, welcome one another just as Christ welcomed you for the glory of God. The church is by its very nature a welcoming entity, a culture of hospitality, a culture of peace, a community of God's people, and together we are to glorify God by welcoming others. This is evangelism. Um, just as God, through Jesus Christ, has brought us into the fold, so to speak, I have to admit, I, I really like and subscribe to St. Augustine's understanding of what church is. Church is not only a welcoming spot for God's people to worship God, to disciple, to proclaim the scripture, but it's also a hospital for the sick. All are welcome through our doors, all. No matter how sick, no matter how sinful, no matter how clean or dirty you are, you're welcome through our doors, so to speak. Now, unfortunately, if you have a temperature, <laughs> man, you're not wearing a mask, <laughs> we'll, we're going to ask you to, to um, uh, view uh, our, our worship from Electronica. <laughs> well, you know, after all, we have to m meet uh, health codes. But our doors are welcome to all. But we also have structure. We don't take in um, the, the heroin addict and make them chief of surgery. So we have integrity and character, a framework of living and loving each other. That framework is the Bible. 
The very nature of hospitality is serving the other person. This is found in the patriarchs that Paul is speaking of. Abraham gives us the first look uh, at, at servanthood uh, in Genesis 18, uh, 3, where the oaks of Mamre, the Lord appeared to Abraham in his tent in the heat of the day. He also um, gives, uh, speaks of Joseph as the servant of Pharaoh, a dream interpreter, the head bazir, high priest of the people of Egypt. Uh, we see David as the model a servant leader of war and peace. Uh, still others, uh, prophets like Hosea, Amos, uh, uh, Isaiah, and even Jesus, who speaks much about being a servant and becoming a great, then you have to become the least. He also speaks the words, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes Jesus welcomes God. When Jesus talks about children, remember that's in context. Children in our day um, are a vibrant part of society, vibrant um, because in many ways, uh, children actually have um, income, a resource, uh, be it second-hand income. Uh, they do uh, business. Um, they can be uh, um, leaders in the community in all sorts of ways. Children in Jesus' times did not have any of those rights. Children not, not only should not be seen or heard of, uh, children ge generally uh, oftentimes were left to the streets. Now, if you were a prosperous family and had room in your home, you had multiple rooms and multiple servants, then you could have servants uh, devoted to um, the care and education of your children. But that was not the typical. In the adult world, 2,000 years ago, children were often on the level with the ostracized, left to fend for their own in the streets. Something dirty. So when Jesus talks about welcoming children, That understanding brings a little a new light to what he's saying. As a church, we're to be a community of believers. We're known to welcome others, and not only to the church, but in our homes and our lives, and even into conversation. Mm. Being a church is being a family. Some of us come into this community with a very strong and real sense of what a welcoming family looks like. Some of us do not. Remember, we don't get to choose the family we come out of, but we do get to choose the family we create. Some of us come out of broken, fractured, dysfunctional families with little idea of what it means to be welcoming. But we are still called to welcome others into the house of the Lord, however that looks. Some of us, hospitality means cooking. We have only to look around the room and I can see uh, dozens that fit um, that mold. I have been in a few of your homes. I know uh, what, what you can make. Uh, and uh, we, we are very blessed with a lot of talented folks. Uh, some are, are, are so good, uh, they, they have risen to chefs and uh, even do business and, and food terms. So, so uh, some of us, hospitality though, means good conversation uh, that may uh, well last well into the night. Uh, I've only looked to in the mirror for that. Uh, I am a preacher after all. I can talk to the wall for a little while. Uh, but, but I do like to talk sometimes. Some of you already know this. For some of us, hospitality means doing something together. A ball game, hunting, shopping, which is just like hunting, it's just more risk. Uh, working on a, a project, thank you for those chuckles. Uh, working on a project together, uh, watching TV together. This is something in COVID-19 world, uh, we've learned how to do a lot. Our family actually has had the opportunity to push the pause button and actually look at each other's face <laughs> for, for uh, much longer than we normally um, have in the past. And I think um, we're finding that 
We've reconnected and we've been way too busy involved in the busyness of being busy. We forgot what it was like to be truly relational. Any culture, hospitality though means welcoming, um, like welcoming honor guests, belonging, being part of something, being part of a family, uh, participation, sharing in gifts, uh, sharing our gifts, sharing our discipleship, doing something together, uh, serving each other. And that's why giving is part of the imagery of Christmas. It's because we give of ourselves a little when we give someone else something. When we teach someone, we are giving them our time. There's always an exchange. Hopefully we're giving something of ourselves, be it uh, a, either our time, our money, our schedules, our attention, our resources, so on and so forth. Giving of oneself is an hospitable act. At the end of the Romans passage, Paul quotes Isaiah, and it's, he says, Therefore I confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your names. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all you peoples praise him. This is big stuff. And then he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Paul speaks of a mighty God of hope who fills, there's a great action verb, who fills us with joy and peace in believing. Peace in believing. There's the concept. Today's peace, the, this day and age that we live in is an unparalleled in history, really. We're currently in a COVID-19 pandemic. We are in a global economy for the first time ever. If one nation over uh, here falters, then another nation over there feels it. When the Japanese yen takes a dip in the Japanese stock market, the U.S. stock markets are directly affected. Folks lose or gain money all over the world. Another way of understanding world connectedness is how war and peace is understood today. Each nation in the world has the right to defend itself and its people against other nations. And how, that's how it's been pretty much since the 17th century. A pair of treaties were signed in 1648 known as the Peace of Westphalia. That peace is the very peace and framework in which the world has operated right up until 9-11. Nine Eleven changed a lot of things because an entity that had no geographical bounds declared war on a nation for the first time. It's an odd world we live in. Times are a-changing. We were talking about the educational process just a few days ago and what that looks like. Psychology is a part of the whole um, kit and caboodle of how teachers operate in the classroom or outside the classroom or, or uh, floating over it or through electronica or some means, uh, the, the cloud, um, swamp gas with the weather balloon, what, whatever, however it's working today. This is not our parents' generation. The world looks very different. Our children are doing things amazing as far as educationally, and they're at a level probably higher than any other generation before it. Information is supremely available, whether it's misinformation or information. Sometimes we don't know, and there's the rub but we are connected. There's a, a, new, 
and the job created in corporate America uh, only in the last 10 years. And the new job is a sociologist, a corporate sociologist. Because it, in the corporation, and I was talking to an, an IBM um, uh, high-level official about two months ago, and, and he was talking about um, that a lot of his uh, engineers now are standing in the hallway or in a meeting, and all three of them stand next to each other, and they're texting each other and having a conversation. Nobody else is around them. There's nothing else going on. That's how they communicate even when they are nose to nose. <laughs> it's, the, it, 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 it's not a good or bad thing. We're not gonna deem it uh, good or evil. It's just different and that's the way it is. And the sociologist's job is to think outside the box and actually improve communications so they'll actually work more efficiently by turning to each other, looking at each other with each other's eyes and actually speaking words out of their mouth. And I know it's a new concept, but, but uh, that's, uh, that's the new learning curve. That's the new position in corporate America. Different world. Our country entered into a war 79 years ago, December 7th, 1941 a date that'll live in infamy to borrow with the words of FDR. We entered that war because war had been declared on, uh, declared on us. Today though, it's starting to evolve into something that has never happened before. Now the, union, the UN has the power to take a police action on a nation because that nation is not take care, taking care of its own people for humanitarian reasons. There are still humanitarian atrocities occurring all over the world, uh, North Korea, Iran, Algeria, Afghanistan, and the list is long and sad. But the peace Jesus speaks of is not a worldly peace. The peace Jesus speaks and the angels proclaim, it has nothing to do with the peace at Westphalia or the peace treaties and V-Day and um, V-E-Day. Peace of Christ is a personal peace for the world. It's a peace each person either embraces or rejects. The peace of Christ embraced is radically transforming because God's love knows no boundaries. About a year and a half ago, I saw a documentary where a man who had been held in prison in uh, the Hanoi Hilton goes back to the very place he was tortured for over three years and meets his torturer, meets the man who was torturing him. The man has had redeemed himself. Believe it or not, the man was a believer. The man was now um, a tour guide in what was formerly known as the Hanoi Hilton. It was an amazing thing to see these two men meet in the grace and peace that was communicated to, through these two guys was astonishing. I have to admit, I question whether I could forgive the man who tortured me physically every day for three years. How many of us could do that? I would say none of us without the peace of Jesus. I would hope the majority of us with the peace of Jesus. The peace of Christ embraced is radically transforming because God's love knows no boundaries. Jesus Christ died for all, not just those who live here or there, not just those who look like this or that, not just for those who have this or don't have that, and no, not even whether we think they deserve it or not. The peace of Christ is given to all people to accept or reject. Being worthy has got nothing to do with it. peace of Christ 
embraced rises to unexpected heights, like witnessing the birth of a child loved by its family or gazing into that child's eyes, looking into the eyes of a new spouse and saying, I love you or I do. The peace of Christ rejected often ends in tragedy though due to our own broken and distorted sinful state the radically transforming nature of God's love taken out of the equation sometimes renders apathy to the point of horrific images a child who's born into a cruel godless world finds its life snuffed out by a plastic bag and dumped in a trash can and don't think i'm talking about a far off country it happens in our country every day or the eyes of a spouse in a godless marriage with a bruised and blackened eye who asks the question is this all there is to life No, mon no wonder so much money is spent on drugs and alcohol each year. A world without the peace of Christ is a world without hope, without love, without truth, and without peace. The unbelievable image of peace is demonstrated in our Old, Old Testament lesson. Isaiah talks about the wolf and the lamb and the calf and the lion and, and so on and so forth and it's almost dizzying but I wanted you to hear all that this morning because it's a mouthful. Only when the entire earth truly knows the Lord as the God of Abraham, who is the God of love, not hate, who sent his son a shoot from the stump of Jesse as Prince of Peace, not the Prince of Judgment to save each one of us is the, is the amazing thing. Jesus is our Prince of Peace and speaks of God's love radically, radically transformational love in ways that provoke us into action here on earth. We are to promote peace on earth by, praying, by claiming that gospel message wherever we go in whatever we're doing, even if we're being beaten in Hanoi Hilton. That's good news. It's amazing news. That's the peace that the Prince of Peace brought in. The joy, the love of God into each one of us. I pray that each one of us would try again. Reach out to those whom we haven't reached out to in a long time or if ever. I pray that we would enact, have the courage to choose to act on God's love that moves us in mighty ways. If you find yourself in this very moment and have never really accepted God's love in your life because of overwhelming feeling of being unworthy, then hear these words. Worthiness has nothing to do with the peace of Jesus. Accepting the gift of the Prince of Peace is accepting the gift of peace in your soul. God's unconditional love and forgiveness given to us through a babe lying in a manger. That we might be transformed and have eternal life. Let's pray for all that. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for caring for us in such a fatherly way and sending us Jesus to be our brother that we might together be engrafted in your family in the most profound way. Give us the courage to act on behalf of your love with others and ourselves in this life. Help us to break down the walls around our hearts that we might open up and be a new creature 
that we might take the energy and the time to go out and profoundly share the love of God with another. Help us to resist the, the need to point a finger, the need to gossip and cut someone up behind their back, the, the need to undermine things or control things or white knuckle things. Give us the freedom and the peace to take a breath, Lord, and let you come into our lives and help us to be okay with you being in control and not us. Give us the peace that passes all understanding that we might start anew today and embrace the peace of Jesus. It is in your name that we pray these things and so much else. Lord, God bless us this Christmas time. May we truly be your disciples, your hands and feet in this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift you up, his countenance upon you, and give you peace, a peace which we are to proclaim to all those in the earth. Amen and amen. <laughs>